There we go. Hi, people online. Hi, people in the building. Nice to see y'all. <laughs> so for today's Sunday School lesson in sort of keeping with your message on, we'll call it also on boundaries to some extent. Yeah. Um, we're going to be discussing boundaries more in depth. Um, but specifically how God has set boundaries with humanity just throughout scripture and then just obviously throughout human history. So, last January, Minister Nick talked about um, what the shame that comes with people pleasing in your Sunday school lesson. Um, and like you, I was also taught that um, I should look after and value others more than myself. But even though the churches we went to said that this was a virtue, it's obviously not. Um, again, so from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is full of instances where God has set boundaries with humanity. So clearly boundaries, that's biblical. <laughs> um, and we've got... We didn't do that episode yet. No, we haven't. <laughs> but um, this uh, presentation will be in our Discord for anyone who wants to access it, and I have a link to your Sunday School lesson from last year. Ye so, a while back, my therapist recommended this amazing book on boundaries by Dr. Henry Cloud and Dr. John Townsend. Um, in it, they talk about like 10 laws that Christians should follow when setting boundaries. So I'm going to be summarizing these today, um, but I encourage everybody to like read this book, listen to the audiobook, um, do whatever you need to to like get your hands on it because it's that life-changing. Um, and actually, if you have a Charlotte um, library card, you can access it for free, for free through Hoopla. That's how I got it. Or a Wake County Library card. Mm -hmm. Wake County Library card, there we go. So I'm using the general term setting boundaries a lot throughout the Sunday School lesson, so I thought it'd be helpful to give you examples of what those look like. Boundaries can be physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, financial, really any other category you can think of. They can also be rules that you set for yourself as well as for others. Um, for example, a physical boundary might look like being affectionate with your partner where you're most comfortable, such as at home rather than in public. A mental boundary could be criticizing those intrusive thoughts rather than believing them. That's the whole mention of the chatterbox. You did a service on it, I believe, recently about it? Something about like shutting, shutting up the, the chatterbox. chatterbox won't shut up. Yeah, yes. That so that is also on the Sanctuary YouTube channel if you want to check that out. Um, an emotional boundary could be taking some time for yourself every day to recharge. Um, and then one that I think is very important is financial boundaries, which also ties a little bit into emotional and mental. Um, cutting someone off who's always asking for money and doesn't manage their finances effectively. Um, again, I'll be putting the Sunday School lesson into Discord for anyone who wants to look back over these examples and explanations, but again, all of these are in the book on boundaries. Uh, now without further ado, here are 10 tips that God gives us for setting boundaries. So, point number one, be aware that you reap what you sow. So this principle is found throughout scripture from Job to James. Basically, you reap what you sow means that everything you do brings consequences or rewards. We see this principle a lot in the Old Testament with God telling the prophets, like Jeremiah, that we're reading uh, right now in Bible study, what happens to people as a result of their idolatry. Now, when it comes to setting boundaries, we need to remember that people must face consequences for their inappropriate behavior and harmful actions. As loving as it might seem to intervene and prevent them from facing consequences, it's not right or biblical to do so. There we go. Point number two, be aware that you're responsible for yourself. Okay, who grew up hearing that women should dress modestly to avoid causing men to stumble? Okay, yes, most of us here. <laughs> Did you know that Jesus shifts the blame to the ones committing adultery instead of, you know, the ones causing men to stumble in the Sermon on the Mount? So rather than blaming women for causing men to lust, Jesus says everything that you see on screen. And all of these Bible verses are taken from the NIV 2011 version, because that's what's on Bible Gateway. Mm -hmm. um, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now this teaching can apply to more than just lust. Self-destructive behavior comes in many forms. But people with healthy boundaries know when to say no to both themselves and to others to avoid reinforcing self-destructive behavior. 
emphasis on yourself <laughs> because it's very hard to say no to yourself. So point number three, be aware that you have the power to become self-aware. Now 1 John 8, 1, 8 through 9 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. As, as uncomfortable as it is to acknowledge our tendency to sin, it's important to be aware of our shortcomings. Besides, it's not possible to live in ignorance if we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will very much convict you. <laughs> uh huh. So once we've been convicted and made aware of our sin, I hear your side, we <laughs> need to confess and repent. People with healthy boundaries know what their shortcomings are, submit their lives to God, make amends, and ask other people to help hold them accountable for changing their behavior. Next. Okay, point number four. Act out of love, not obligation. James 2, 14 through 17 says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Similarly, love without action is worthless. Although we have this idea that love means allowing people to do whatever they want to us, scripture shows that God, who is love personified, doesn't let things slide. I know it can be tempting to excuse a person's inappropriate behavior or meet their unreasonable demands because they're their family, their partner, or their best friend, but our obligation to people prevents us from setting firm boundaries. We should follow God's example by giving our time, attention, and resources to people only when we'll feel good about doing so. Number five, communicate your boundaries with your loved ones. Now Exodus 19 is a good example of God setting physical boundaries with people. Now for context, Moses had just led the Israelites out of Egypt, and God promised to appear um, to Moses on Mount Sinai. However, God didn't want just anyone approaching the mountain in their present state. The people had to wash their clothes, abstain from sex, and stand back until God said they, that they could approach. More importantly, God communicated these boundaries with Moses so the people wouldn't accidentally overstep them and bear the consequences, which was... So, when we're committed to someone whether it's a romantic relationship or a platonic one, we must tell them our boundaries. People with healthy boundaries don't resent their loved ones because they make their limits clear and are honest about how they feel when their boundaries are overstepped. And I'm gonna emphasize this is for people who are in a committed relationship and this is not necessarily going to apply when you're trying to distance yourself from someone. Because in that case, communicating your boundaries might not actually be beneficial. So number six, respect others' boundaries. Um, in giving us free will, God knew that we would make stupid and harmful decisions. <sighs> yeah. The Gospel of Luke outlines many of the choices that the religious leaders made leading up to their decision to crucify Jesus. Yes, the crucifixion was part of God's bigger plan, but also consider God could have freed Jesus at any point. And yet, here's what happened. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, and they, and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Like Jesus, we must also accept that people have the freedom to make their own decisions, including ones that hurt us. But we also have the freedom to end a relationship that is no longer healthy or mutually beneficial. Number seven, take the initiative to find your limits. In the book of Job, Zophar is one of three people who attempts to explain to Job why he's suffering. Here's how he responds when Job complains that God isn't giving him a reason. Can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens above. What can you do? They are deeper than the depths below. What can you know? Although Job's friend Zophar is a terrible example of emotional support, like don't ever go to him for emotional support, <laughs> he did make a good point that God is bigger than us. And the things that happen to us aren't necessarily personal attacks or necessarily like consequences of our past behavior. 
God actually says something similar along those lines in chapter 38. But at the end of the book, Job realizes that he complained about things he didn't understand, and so he repents. However, he learned a valuable lesson about taking the initiative. Crying out rather than assuming God wouldn't answer him turned out to be the right decision. Being passive can be detrimental to our spiritual, emotional, and mental growth. But people with healthy boundaries take risks and speak up, even if it means getting pushed back like, pushed back like Job did. Okay, number eight. Set boundaries proactively, not just reactively. I personally, I have a hard time setting boundaries in general. This is one of the ones I struggle with. So in the days leading up to his crucifixion, Jesus told his disciples, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them. This reminds me of all the times in the Old Testament that God gave the Israelites specific instructions to follow when settling in a new, in a new land, like in Exodus 19 or just literally all of Leviticus, right? Mm -hmm. um, God didn't wait till they started worshiping idols to say, eh, don't do that. Similarly, Jesus told his disciples how to be Christ-like before he left them, not after the fact. Setting boundaries is a balancing mm -hmm. act. Placing limits up front allows us to protect ourselves while still being able to connect with others. Quack. Mm -hmm. There we go. Evaluate your actions. Will they hurt or harm? And I'm going to make a quick distinction between hurt. Hurt means primarily emotional discomfort, not necessarily something that's bad for the person. Harm, obviously, is bad for the person. Um, 2 Corinthians, especially chapters 10 through 13, is a warning to a wayward church. After addressing the false apostles within the, their ranks, Paul leaves the church of Corinth with these scathing words. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you, unless, of course, you fail the test? So I mentioned earlier that knowing our shortcomings allows us to treat people better and follow God more readily. Otherwise, we might end up receiving discipline like the church in Corinth did. Self-awareness also helps us set boundaries proactively. By evaluating whether our actions will simply hurt or actually harm someone, we can make more confident decisions. Just like with the Church of Corinth, confronting someone who has done wrong might hurt them, for a little while at least. However, we can't let their emotional discomfort prevent us from setting limits that will ultimately benefit them. And now, number 10, evaluate your envy. Where do you have trouble setting boundaries? Remember how we're supposed to be responsible for ourselves? By a show of hands, how many of us have trouble staying in our own lane? Uh-huh, <laughs> yep, Nick's holding up two hands, yep, yep. So, yeah, Jesus addressed people like us in Sermon on the Mount. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? It's just, I just want to hide, I'm covered at this point. Although, although Jesus was mostly speaking about judging others, this passage could also apply to envy. It's destructive when we spend all of our time focusing on what others have, rather than moving towards our own goals and calling. <laughs> you okay? No, we're uh, good. We're great. We're fantastic. <laughs> we're not, but it's fine. It's all right. You know, emotional discomfort is a hard group. Yep, yep. <laughs> Like I said, this emotional damage. Emotional <laughs> damage. Yes. So, however, envy can also help us identify the reasons why we're unable to mind our own business. It's a non binary thing. So, once we realize why we're envious of someone, we can call on God for help changing our mindset because that's usually where the boundary issues lie. Whew. Okay, so we covered a lot in this Sunday school lesson. So, again, uh -huh. thank you for sticking with me again. This will all be in the Discord um, to anyone who wants to look over it. Any questions? I have to really admit that when you point out those verses about the, if it, you know, the verses say, if thy hand offends thee, if mm -hmm. thy eye offends thee, doesn't say if the girl's skirt offends you right. or if somebody walking by, you don't like somebody walking by, it mm -hmm. says if you have the problem. Right. And I never really picked up on that before you pointed that out. Yeah, it's, no. I could, if I could summarize setting boundaries, it's basically stay in your own lane. Um, mm -hmm. 
I mean, that's and I don't... people here need a lesson in, but that's a whole other topic. But, and I also feel like, and this might segue into something we can discuss on a podcast or something, but I feel like a lot of us grew up in these churches where staying in our own lane was seen as unloving, where it was, oh my gosh, you know, your neighbor is out there sinning, your neighbor is out there, like, doing whatever is wrong with them. You have to intervene. That's an act of love. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. So let me just... Go for it. Devil's advocate. <laughs> um, so what about people with a gift of prophecy? Like, they don't stay in their own lane. Right? Hmm. And I, and I know that there's a different, you know, there's a difference between looking out at your neighbor and judging them, but I'm just mm-hmm. thinking about certain gifts that definitely <laughs> they don't stay in their lane. And that is a very valid point that I hadn't really <laughs> thought about. I mean, same. That's well, yeah. but are they staying in their lane because that is their lane? Hmm. Because that is what they're supposed to do. It's part of their calling. It's part of their calling. So it's like I've said, I mean, when you're called to do something in church when you're a leader, Mm -hmm. the Bible says about bringing our acceptable service. So that's your acceptable service. So Mm -hmm. being a prophet, that is their lane. I guess it's it's kind of like merging where like, (laughs) well, you can be on your, in your lane on a road and then you have to like, merge into another one but you don't stay merged forever so i guess that would probably be the prophetic like you kind of blended it yeah. you're supposed to blend at a certain point well yeah. and i mean i guess like with anything you have to you have to validate what the prophet is saying like so anybody mm-hmm. can say they're a prophet and tell right. you what to do but it's like mm-hmm. you have mm-hmm. to verify that that's true. right that's, testing the spirit that's where yeah. your boundaries mm-hmm. are right. maybe mm-hmm. that, that you're yeah. like i'm gonna listen i'm gonna see if there's some truth to this and right. you know, and but if you're a true prophet and you're hearing from God, mm-hmm. you are not in someone else's lane. He is. You're just mm-hmm. the um, middle per. You're just mm-hmm. the means mm-hmm. to get to that person. Mm-hmm. It may a lot of times your prophecy has nothing to do with with you. I mean, mm-hmm. it's not something you would feel right. or you would right. say or you would think mm-hmm. that's coming out of your mouth from him. To that person, I mean, it's happened to me. I did a few things that, you know, I, you know, when you're doing it or mm-hmm. it's coming to you to do it, mm-hmm. it's not coming from you actually. Yeah, that makes sense. It's really not yeah. coming from me, the person, Nina. That's my opinion, my thoughts, my ideas. You're not. You're the, totally not. The word in the Old Testament, and they're probably sick of hearing it. Am I wrong? No. Okay. What is this word? Navi. And it literally means to bubble up. Mm, So like in other words, in the way I kind of explain it, in in my book, which I think we're starting that this month, at the end of the month, we're starting the pneumatology, I categorize all the charismatic gifts Mm -hmm. into groups because I like groups. And I think that it just makes it easier to understand. We're not going to memorize 17 of them. You know, when people start asking me what they all are, I'm real proud when I can get through like 12. Mm-hmm. But, you know, they're, whether it's, I call their pro- prophetic gifts. And so prophecy and word of wisdom and word of knowledge. And, you know, th- those would be, and technically I guess speaking in tongues would be part of that. When you operate in it, it operates like a navi. It mm-hmm. operates like something that bubbles up, that comes out. Um, who I think it's Jeremiah who yeah. said fire up the fire, fire that that I have to something about yeah. I, I cannot be silent because of the fire shut up in my bones. It's like it has to come out, mm-hmm. and so that would be the difference. Then, oh by the way, I don't like you. You're doing this. It's my opinion mm-hmm. that there, there's a different context to it. Mm-hmm. How many times have you done it before? What? Navi? Give, yeah, you know. Like, a lot. I, I don't I know. Mean, a lot. She's done it over and over. Like if at the end of a service, if mm-hmm. people want to come up for prayer, mm-hmm. she's seen people she doesn't even know, she never mm-hmm. even saw before. And yeah. she's given them a word. So mm-hmm. I went and I did a visit, a house visit this week for mm-hmm. a church in Asheville. The pastor who bought me this hat. I went and I did a, a visit for one of his members in Hickory mm-hmm. and I prayed for her and she got this look on her face and she said, you prayed my exact 
prayers for myself. Mm -hmm. She said, you even use the same wording. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, she didn't know. I didn't know. I don't know her real well. I mean, you know, I've, I, I've crossed her a couple, past a couple times, but we've never talked about anything mm -hmm. like that. And so that would be an example of that, that it's like I say, I talk and I'm talking, but whatever it is that processes the thought is not there. And so it's like I'm speaking, but I'm not speaking by my own power. And I don't often don't remember what I say. Like I have no idea what I said to her. I have no clue. That's why we record stuff because I don't remember people will. And I mean, I, I had somebody, I, I, I ministered to her son 15 years ago. He's now in his 20s. And she came and found me and said how everything I said happened. And I swear, I have no idea what I said. I remember I was at the church. I remember being there. I remember what I was wearing. And I remember my shoes. But I don't remember anything else. <laughs> it's so in essence, it doesn't really come from that person. Right. They just have, it comes through them. It's their lane. Yeah. It's that, that's their lane. That's the difference. And like you say, the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. In other words, we just don't get to say whatever we want. It has to undergo like the spirits are tested. And I imagine if you do say whatever you want, claim to be a prophet, God's going to have a big issue with that. Oh, yeah. Reaping what oh, you yeah. sow, the whole, you know, you're responsible for yourself, you'll get all the consequences. So There's a little argument about that on my TikTok still. I did a TikTok about Julie Green, who's one of these... Oh. QAnon Trump people who supposedly prophesize all this stuff and there are people I have not said a word I just put it up they're all fighting I say okay keep going you know keep doing it because that means I get more views so right. go ahead so they're making it viral I know it's like well we got any other questions if not I'm gonna turn it over to Apostle Leanne for announcements okay. thanks for joining us online we'll see you in what maybe 30 45 minutes yeah. for okay. sermon Okay. Oh, don't we do selfie? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm so glad somebody else is having a hard time getting it <laughs> off. I thought it was just me. Oh no. <laughs> the smallest of buttons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's in a Excuse weird Excuse our technical difficulties. <laughs>